Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dr. Samuel M. Jordan Center for Persian Studies. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to have our first speaker in a uh, series uh, that was designed mainly by Professor Simcha Gross uh, here at UCI. Uh, I tried to help. Uh, we were able to receive a grant from Humanities Commons, which we thank them, and the Jordan Center tried to uh, attempted to match that, which has done so. And in cooperation with Oxford University Professor uh, Johan uh, Sohrabdin Shavavaina and uh, Dr. Sergey Minov, uh, we tried to do an exchange where some scholars were there and gave eight papers, including myself and Professor Gross, uh, on minorities and the empire and its relations. Uh, now we are beginning tonight uh, with our first speaker, which Professor Gross will be introducing. Our second leg of crucible of empire on the state of minorities in the Sicilian Empire. And uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce the, actually the mastermind behind this idea of uh, religious minorities in the Sicilian Empire, Professor Sempar I'll be very brief. Uh, we're very pleased to have with us uh, Professor Scott McDonough, who is an associate professor uh, at, uh, of history at William Patterson University in New Jersey. His research interests lie in the social, institutional, and religious history of late ancient West Asia, especially pre-Islamic Iran and Caucasia. He is currently working on a monograph entitled Sassanian Iran, Power, Patronage, and Piety, which we published in 2019. Uh, he also has a study of royal succession in Sassanian Iran that he's currently working on. Uh, and uh, he's going to publish a survey textbook uh, entitled A Short History of the Caucasus to 1750 uh, CE. So he uh, has really great breadth. Uh, I should just briefly note two other things. Number one, uh, both Professor McDonough and Professor Darayi were trained at the feet of the same master, uh, Michael Murray in UCLA, and that uh, Professor McDonough's dissertation which has never been published officially, is undoubtedly the most widely cited dissertation, but maybe also book, uh, in uh, maybe Sassanian studies, but certainly in the topic of uh, minority, religious minorities in the Sassanian Empire. So without further ado, uh, we're very pleased that that's done. introduction. Uh, thanks to uh, Taraj and Simcha uh, and to the Jordan Center for having me out uh, this evening. Um, I'm, uh, as the, uh, the title here says, I'm going to be talking uh, specifically about uh, the role of Christians in the royal courts of Sasanian kings. I'll start with a quote uh, from uh, pseudo Sabaeus, an uh, Armenian historian. Uh, when he, the general Sembat Bragratuni, had approached within a day's journey of the royal court, the king ordered all the nobles in his army to go out to meet him. He commanded the auxiliaries to meet him with a fine horse from the royal stable with uh, royal equipage. Uh, so he proceeded with great splendor and glory and presented himself to the king. On seeing him, uh, he welcomed him with joy and stretched out his hand to him, uh, he kissed his hand and fell on his face. Then the king said to him, You have done your duty loyally, and we are especially grateful to you. From now on, trouble no more to wage war, but stay here, close by. Take, eat, and drink, and devote yourself to our happiness. He was the third noble in the palace of the king, Khosrov, and uh, after remaining there a short time, he died in the 28th year of his reign. They brought his dead body to the land of Armenia, to his ancestral, ancestral sepulcher, and placed it in a tomb, and I'll leave it there. Um, Simbad Bagratuni's career uh, is entirely consistent with a number of late Sasanian aristocratic generals, uh, like Bahram Shubin or uh, Shah Faraz, uh, albeit without their rather spectacular triumphs and failures. Um, 
his kind of uh, uh, list of offices held during his life. He served as a Mars Bon, uh, a border lord. Uh, he was appointed to the title, uh, which in Armenia is rendered as the Warrior of the Lords. Um, he was given uh, the kind of honorific, uh, the joy of Husro, uh, and given a number of, of privileges, including being recognized as the third noble in the king's palace. Uh, notably, uh, along with his advancement through these offices, his son, uh, Faraz Kirots, uh, was raised uh, by Khusro at court, uh, appointed as a cupbearer, uh, eventually given the title uh, Eternal Khusro um, uh, to honor his father. Now, this is an interesting thing. It's one of the uh, relatively few examples we have of a sort of uh, the promotion of a general, uh, the rise of a general in Sasanian Iran kind of laid out in some detail. But what's remarkable about Sembet, in a way, is that uh, not only is he an Armenian, but he's also a Christian. Uh, a Christian who, at least according to an Armenian source, which we can believe or not believe, uh, was third ranked in the palace of the king. Um, in fact, Khusro II has a lot of Christians at his court. Uh, his queen of queens, uh, his chief queen, Shireen, uh, his chief royal physician, Gabriel of Sinjar, uh, the uh, head of the Church of the East, Sabre Show, is a frequent uh, uh, resident at the court of the king, uh, Sembet Bagratuni and his son, uh, and his finance minister, Yazdin, as well as a number of other Christian hangers-on, like the court astrologer, Mar Abba, uh, various financial officials and other physicians that supported the king uh, are all Christians under Khusro II. So how exactly did Christians come to play such prominent roles in the courts of the later Sasanian kings? Uh, how did Christians interact with the king at court and to what end? Uh, and how did politically powerful Christians challenge or complement the traditional elites of Sasanian Iranshar? So, uh, for this presentation, I'm going to, uh, since I'm first in line among all these presentations, I'm going to take advantage of that to give a little bit of background about Christians in the Sasanian Empire, uh, and then move to talking about my notions of uh, what types of Christians there are in uh, the, the court of the Sasanian kings. Um, now, there are a lot of stories about how Christianity comes to uh, Iran. Certainly there are stories of the apostles uh, bringing Christianity to Iran. Uh, we know uh, that, at least in the Roman Empire, that uh, early missionaries, Christian missionaries, uh, attempted to proselytize in synagogues, and certainly uh, there are Jewish communities uh, within uh, the lands that become the Sasanian uh, Empire. Uh, we know of the existence of a number of kind of Jewish, Christian, pagan, for lack of a better word, Gnostic groups uh, resident in Babylonia, like the Alkazites, uh, uh, the Marcionites, and other groups here. Uh, and then there are a number of other stories about Christianity coming from the city of Edessa uh, in a sort of Syriac-speaking form, uh, Greek-style Christianity coming to uh, the Sasanian world through various deportations of Christians, uh, particularly to Khuzestan. Um, and certainly uh, there are a number of stories associated with the 4th and 5th century uh, about various martyr stories associated with Christians uh, in the Iranian world, whether uh, in Mesopotamia, Babylonia, or, or Armenia. What I would draw from these stories not, is not necessarily that the, each of these stories is true, uh, or that each of these stories about the coming of Christianity, uh, you know, is uh, one is better than any other. Uh, what I think we should draw is that Christianity in the Iranian world was very diverse. Uh, that there are probably a number of ways of proselytizing uh, by Christians uh, in the Iranian world. Uh, that there were probably a number of regional centers that had their own distinct forms of Christianity. Uh, there were certainly Christian communities built around sort of ethnic and linguistic communities within the Sasanian world, whether Aramaic, Syriac-speaking, Greek, Armenian, Persian. Um, 
And also, there are distinct Christianities built around sort of an urban model of Christianity and a sort of rural or aristocratic model of Christianity, which I'll get into more later on. Then, laid on top of all this, of course, is the, the standard tendency of Christian groups to split into ever more uh, fiddly sects uh, having to do with uh, issues of the nature of Christ and things like that. Uh, Chalcedonianism, the Church of the East, sometimes called the Nestorian Church, uh, Myophysite Christianity here. Now, we see evidence of this in a number of things. Uh, the Synodicon Orientale, which is an account of the synods of the Church of the East, uh, lists more than, pardon me, uh, five separate bishops of the city of Beth Lefot, uh, uh, June de uh, all coming to the same council, each claiming to be the one true bishop of the city. Uh, so clearly there are a lot of different independent communities here that don't necessarily always get along. Um, probably uh, are competing for Christians and a variety of other things here. But nevertheless, despite this great diversity here, uh, it's clear that there was a sort of substantial Christianization of the landscape of Iran uh, in uh, pre-Islamic era. That there are mythologies of Christianization, which I've already alluded to. There are a number of stories of martyrdoms in various places that may uh, where the blood of the martyrs have sanctified various locales, uh, uh, Christians who died for the faith, something I'll talk about a bit more in a second. And in addition, uh, we can see through sources like the Synodicon Orientale, um, the extension of Christian Episcopal sees, the seats of bishops around Iran, uh, up to the year 605 here. Uh, the earliest Episcopal sees are in red, and the latest are, are somewhat hard to see. They're in, in purple here, but you can trace various councils. Uh, and when the first appearance of, of bishops of various places in Iran uh, happened here. Um, in addition, uh, there is a growing archaeology of uh, Christian material culture in the Sasanian world, uh, such as these pot shirts, uh, many of which have kind of standard uh, Iranian themes, but others add uh, various types of crosses uh, to the stamps on pots. So certainly uh, Iran in, in many ways was a very Christianized place uh, in the Sasanian period. So how did the Sasanians interact with Christianity? Uh, well, there have been many uh, writers who have tried to make the point that the rise of the Sasanians was in some sense a kind of uh, rise of a political dynasty with a sort of militant sense of Zoroastrian mission uh, to spread fire altars and build various shrines to Ahura Mazda and the various Zoroastrian divinities. Uh, certainly Ardashir uh, puts on his coins a fire altar uh, on the reverse of his coins here and the kings make a number of of rather explicit claims of uh, Mazda worshipping piety here, uh, their official title calling themselves the sort of Mazda worshipping lord, uh, king of kings of Iran whose origin is from the gods. Um, and in fact the Sasanian family is said in various sources to have originated as sort of the temple guardians of the temple of Anahita at Istakar. Uh, so, there's many reasons, there are many reasons to believe uh, that the early Sasanian kings wanted to promulgate a view of themselves as being especially pious and zealous in the spread of uh, Zoroastrianism or Bajanism. However, there are a number of other sort of countervailing arguments to that, and, and I would argue that despite this very kind of public profession of Mazda worship here, uh, that in practice the Sasanians were less concerned with actual uh, attempts to sort of spread Zoroastrianism than we might expect. Uh, this is despite the fact that we have as one of our early Sasanian inscriptions the inscription of the priest Kirdir, uh, who says uh, that due to his actions Jews, Buddhists, Hindus, Nazarenes, Christians, Baptists, and Manichaeans were smashed in the empire, their idols destroyed, and the habitations of the gods annihilated and turned into abodes and seats of gods. 
there are certainly reasons to think that there would be tensions between Zoroastrians, Magians, and Christians. Um, certainly many Christian practices were offensive to Zoroastrian sensibilities. Uh, Zoroastrian ideas about purity and pollution, uh, particularly the burial of the dead or baptism, uh, were things that polluted respectively the soil and uh, the, the water. Uh, Christian practices of celibacy and asceticism seem to be kind of overt denials of the goodness of creation, something that was uh, alarming uh, to Zoroastrians in many ways. Uh, the fact that Christians frequently uh, and very openly called all other gods false gods, demons, uh, and, in fact, there are stories of Christians kind of smashing up altars and things like that, and their zeal for their own religion. And, and also the fact that, that Christians uh, were not content to just be Christian and leave other people alone. They wanted, uh, they had this universal mission of conversion of everyone to their faith here. Uh, add to that another wrinkle uh, in uh, the very aggressive uh, missionizing of Man Mani and his followers, uh, who, while not themselves Christians, certainly incorporated a number of Christian ideas into their sort of syncretistic uh, faith. Um, but one of the biggest problems was the fact that the nearby empire, the mortal enemy of the Sasanians, uh, Imperial Rome, uh, after Constantine, was substantially Christianized. And you can see on this coin of Theodosius II, uh, a sort of uh, victory carrying the cross on the reverse of the coin here. Uh, at least in theory, this didn't do Christians any favors in Sasanian Iran. So the conventional narrative has been that, uh, particularly under Shapur II, that there was a massive persecution of Christians, starting off with the bishop of uh, the city of Selipiak Tesfan, uh, which ultimately re resulted in enough Christians dying uh, that Fifty years later, a Roman bishop uh, removed 100,000 relics from the lands of Iran, uh, that is the bones of saints, uh, to be taken back to his uh, home city, which he subsequently renamed Martyropolis, the city of the martyrs. I think, though, that this is somewhat overstated, uh, that a, a central part of Christian narratives uh, has always been persecution, that persecution builds the faith, that the the blood of the martyrs is the root of the church. Um, what seems to be more the case is that in general people were pretty, uh, at least the Sasanian kings were largely indifferent to Christians. Um, there may have been instances of local persecution or general persecution, but in, in general uh, I tend to think that persecution is overstated. Particularly because with the growing numbers of Christians in the Sasanian Empire, uh, Christians formed a pretty substantial part of the population of the empire that actually paid taxes. <laughs> uh, so they paid taxes, but on the other hand, the aristocracy, the Iranian aristocracy, uh, at least the upper aristocracy, did not pay taxes. <laughs> uh, and to add to that, um, you know, particularly in the late fourth century. Uh, the aristocracy was known for killing kings in various ways, including quite memorably dropping a tent on one of them uh, to, uh, to kill him. Uh, now, by the 5th century, uh, tensions with the Roman Empire had largely sort of settled down, uh, which seems to, these three things, the sort of growing Christian population, tensions with the aristocracy, uh, a sense of kind of detente with the Roman Empire, seems to have motivated Yazgar the first uh, to, in some sense, officially recognize the Christian church in his domain. Uh, this was accomplished at a church synod, uh, which uh, is described in the, the Christian records of this, uh, that the king actually called the synod, invited bishops to gather at one of the royal capitals, so you keep a test uh, and meet to settle various disputes in the church. Uh, he also put at his uh, at the disposal of the bishops who came to attend the, the council uh, the sort of royal postal system and things so they could get to the capital. Now, subsequently, and I'm not sure where that slide's showing, so I'm going to skip that. Um, 
subsequently, uh, we have a lot of evidence that this act of officially recognizing the church was, was well received, particularly by the elites of the church, the bishops. Uh, that the Church of the East and its bishops gained sort of official recognition and support from various Sasanian kings, uh, and in turn the Christians sought to accommodate the interests of their kings. Uh, Christian leaders, particularly bishops, often came to view the King of Kings as a sort of patron and in some sense a protector of Christians, uh, and in the long term as a possible convert in the future to uh, Christianity here. Uh, at the same time, Christian writings tend, after this event, to portray the kind of traditional priests and aristocrats as largely hostile to Christianity. That the king is their defender and the aristocrats are out to get them. Um, but what we see from this point on is that in general, Christians are quite loyal to the Sasanian state and particularly to the Sasanian dynasty. Uh, we see all sorts of very fulsome praise of the Sasanian kings in the Synodicon. Uh, we all ask unanimously for our merciful God that he adds days and days to the victorious and illustrious king, uh, Yazgard, king of kings. Uh, they call uh, Husro II, uh, let's see if I have it here, the, uh, is it in this passage? No. Uh, in one of them, they, they call him the, the new Cyrus. Uh, and then in a particularly uh, obsequious bit of prose here, uh, it pleased his providence to turn to us in his mercy, for he has visited the earth today in his, this troubled time. He has brought forth from the famous race of a glorious kingdom, a master, good, powerful, victorious, pacific, the philanthropist, lord of worlds, Hormiz, king of kings, for the peace of all the inhabited earth and the joy of all the inhabitants of the universe. By the hands of this prince and by his powerful, good, and wise commandments, he has made the immeasurable riches of mercy, his mercy appear. Indeed, our Lord, the good, victorious King of Kings, in a liberal spirit, imbued with the love of God and the love of men, rich in admirable wisdom, well, you can point. Uh, this goes on and on and on. Uh, so, Certainly there are very loud and very public professions by the leaders of uh, the Christian church, what's usually called the Church of the East, of their loyalty to the King of the Kings, their support of the Sasanian King of Kings. And in some sense this seems to have been reciprocated. Uh, a famous quote attributed to the same king, very lavishly praised on the last slide, uh, Hormuz is said to have said, just as our royal throne cannot stand on its two front legs without the two back legs, our kingdom cannot stand or endure firmly if we cause the Christians and the adherents of other faiths who differ in belief from ourselves to become hostile to us. So, what I think we see is a kind of gradual trend towards the kind of normalization of Christianity in Sasanian Iran. Uh, now, to switch gears and talk about the court, um, I think, though, that we should not assume that all Christians are equal in the empire. In fact, this, they're decidedly not. Uh, when Christians appear in court, uh, there are Christians that come in from various different kind of avenues, but roughly speaking, I think we should divide the Christians that appear in the courts of the late Sasanian kings as Christians who are kind of rising elites who gain access to the court uh, but don't necessarily have a power base of their own outside of very local power bases or power bases within the Christian church. The other group, and the one that's a little harder to, to pin down, but, but a very interesting group though, are aristocrats who become Christian. Uh, and that they have very different styles and different forms of power in the empire. Now, we know a certain amount about uh, Sasanian kings and courts. We have a number of early inscriptions uh, that tell us basically that you have roughly this order of precedence in the empire, the royal family, uh, people of royal rank that, who call themselves kings, uh, princes, uh, then representatives of sort of noble great families, mostly Parthian uh, in origin, uh, and then finally various officials from the kind of lower nobility, uh, priests and things here. Now, 
to a great extent, and I tend to, to believe in a kind of view of the Sasanian Empire, that the, the Sasanian Empire is not a terribly centralized empire. It is an empire that relies on constant negotiation and renegotiation between kings and various uh, people in the empire that have local power. Uh, and a big element of this, traditionally in the Sasanian Empire, is the reliance of the kings, uh, particularly on religious officials, to do their bidding. Uh, to get local Zoroastrian or Magian officials to act as judges, administrators, play roles in tax collection and sealing documents and things. And this is the avenue that I think that Christians first arrive on the scene at court through. Uh, as these kind of lower officials here. Uh, I used the, uh, in a very early paper I wrote years ago, the, the title Bishops or Bureaucrats. Um, but we do see a lot of bishops uh, who are asked to play this role. Um, collect the taxes on the Christian community. Uh, we want you to be responsible for justice in the Christian community. You mediate uh, within you, your community. Uh, we want you bishops to, uh, in, in one rather memorable case, uh, the king is said to have had a problem on the Persian Gulf, uh, and he sends a bishop to check it out and report back to the capital here. Uh, more common, though, are kings going on embassies, or sorry, uh, bishops going on embassies, particularly to the Roman world, uh, where they have, at least in theory, a sort of in with their fellow religionists here. Um, but gradually, Christians also uh, gravitate to roles more closely at court as advisors of kings and other royal officials. Uh, one of the early interesting examples of this is Barsalma, the bishop of Nisibis, uh, who seems to have been a favorite, uh, if not of King Perose, of some of his high officials. Uh, Barsalma boasts that he's valuable to the king uh, because he is an expert in the affairs of the borders. Uh, Nisibis being the border city between the Roman Empire and the Sasanian Iran. Uh, Barsalma is also an interesting figure because he gets into a very uh, heated and <laughs> conflict with the leader of the Church of the East, Baboe, uh, which ultimately results in uh, Baboe's execution. <laughs> uh, that the Catholicos, the head of the church, sends a letter to the Roman Emperor in which he says something along the lines of, God has delivered us into the hands uh, of a pagan kingdom, uh, which Barsama intentionally translates as, God has delivered us into the hands of an impious kingdom, uh, which uh, Peroz is enraged by this and has the, the Catholicos executed. Uh, and, Perose proceeds to back a, a lot of Barsama's positions within the church. Uh, there are a number of synods that uh, decide things in his favor, but this is really interesting because of the way that Barsama builds a, a power base with the king, uh, also uh, you know, with local officials in his city, and uses it to his own advantage within the church to you know, boost his own positions within the church and remove, in this case, uh, a sort of political enemy within the Christian church, uh, the Catholicos. So, what we seem to see here is that, uh, particularly, uh, at least after Yazgir, the, the Church of the East, what's sometimes called the Nestorian Church, uh, becomes in some sense a kind of state church. I mean, I don't like that term, but I'll use it anyway. Um, that the king endorses the authority of bishops, and this allows him to extend his networks of royal patronage and authority. It allows him to build uh, you know, these Christian bishops into this kind of network of you know, priests that serve the, the empire. Uh, and also, it serves him well among Christians. Uh, the king is the pious king who supports our church. Uh, also, the church serves rather nicely as a means of extending Sasanian political and social influence. I mean, it's worth noting, in fact, that uh, in the Synod of 497, the, a number of bishops represent cities that are not actually part of the Sasanian Empire anymore, but they still swear loyalty to the Sasanian king. Um, in addition, the church uses the kings, too. 
this extends the influence of the church and its officials. Um, and the thing that really makes this work well uh, is fundamentally that the Church of the East doesn't really have the institutional power to threaten the monarch. Uh, they're not a threat, so they can cooperate. <laughs> uh, now, there seems in the last century of the Sasanian rule, though, a certain amount of competition of who gets this privileged position vis-a-vis -vis the king. Uh, is it the Church of the East, or is it rising Myophysite churches, or uh, Armenian church, or things like that? But So, um, on the court of Husserl II, I think a number of officials fit in, into this, or a number of courtiers fit this. Uh, Shireen, uh, who is the Queen of Queens, her origins are a bit mysterious, but she seems to be uh, an Aramean, uh, Aramaic speaker, Syriac speaker from Khuzestan. Uh, and she is the queen. Uh, her uh, son, Mardan Shah, is the crown prince. Uh, and she has an enormous amount of influence over the king in a variety of things, mostly shown through our sources in defense of the church, or at least the defense of her version of Christianity that she supports. Um, now, this can be a bit of a problem because in uh, half of our sources, uh, she's reviled uh, for her heresy uh, as a supporter of myophysitism. Uh, and in myophysite sources, she's lauded as, as the one woman who protects the tomb of the prophet Daniel at Shush um, and, uh, you know, successfully uh, diverts the king's anger from the church and rewards uh, our uh, Christians in the empire. She also cooperates with the chief physician, uh, Gabriel of Sinjar, uh, who's, uh, unfortunately, our, our best sources on him are all very negative about him. <laughs> uh, they tend to give us lots and lots of detail about his uh, keeping multiple wives, which is a no-no for a Christian, uh, at least in, in theory. Um, but he's someone who seems to have, uh, is said to have made his way into the queen's good uh, wishes by curing her infertility. Um, he's excommunicated from the Church of the East and then proceeds to uh, turn himself into uh, a major player in disputes between uh, different Christian factions here. Now, um, the final kind of Aramean who's rising up in the Church uh, that I'll talk about very briefly uh, is the Catholicos Sabri Show. Uh, who is a nobody, <laughs> at least at first. He's described as being a son of a shepherd. Uh, he is a speaker of Aramaic, so he's not part of the Iranian elite. Uh, but he's known as a kind of holy man, a miracle worker. He uh, becomes a favorite of the queen, uh, rises very quickly to uh, bishop, and eventually ascends to the Catholicate. Uh, and quite interestingly, he, he takes the office of Catholicos with the king's support. Um, and after taking the office of Catholicos, he's basically called upon by the king to do various things. In particular, most notably, uh, he is sent with one of the, the generals uh, of the empire to put down a rebellion in the city of Nisibis, to win the Christian population who might be involved in this uh, rebellion away from the rebels and things like that. And in fact, uh, Sabri Show dies on this campaign uh, to, you know, save his king here. So, for these people who are coming from outside of the avenues of power, I think probably the exemplar that they're looking to is, is this sort of Daniel. Uh, you know, that, that Daniel, this, uh, you know, Israelite who works for uh, a foreign king, uh, and uh, you know is constantly put in situations of peril in which he has to to keep his faith uh, in the face of the overwhelming authority of uh, you know his ruler. Um, you know the stories of uh, Daniel in the lion's den and things like that, and his companions being cast into the fiery furnace. You know this this is the idea for a, a sombre show. You know how do you you know protect your people? How do you keep your advance the interests of your people while serving a king? that is not of your faith. And you'll notice in this illustration of Daniel from the uh, Syriac Bible of Paris, that in fact he is dressed as a sort of Sasanian noble here. 
Uh, he's also notably unbearded because, generally speaking, they thought that Daniel was a eunuch uh, in uh, his time. Now, on the other hand, uh, what about aristocrats uh, and Iranians who become Christian? Um, I think I'll skip that. There is a tendency of our Christian sources to highlight a lot of converts from Magian which I think we should be suspicious of. Because, obviously, it's a big win for Christians if they convert someone to the faith. Uh, it's not a big win if someone was born and raised a Christian and they go on to be Christian. It's a much bigger win if they were a Zoroastrian and they convert, because this is a sign of the inevitability of Christian triumph here. Um, but also it makes a good story because, you know, uh, after a certain point, most of the martyr stories that we have of, of Christians being killed uh, are of con converts who are Iranian. Uh, and a lot of people have made quite a bit of this, uh, you know, that, that uh, you know, Christianity is legitimized, but we don't want Zoroastrians converting. Um, I don't think that's exactly what's happening here. Uh, I think a lot of it is that, you know, we have these people being kind of put up in front to say, you know, these are people who've come to our faith of their own free will and have died for the faith. You know, they make a good story. Doesn't mean it's not exactly the case here, but what we do have in terms of less literary evidence is that we do see a lot of names that are Iranian and in many cases specifically mentioned gods like Ormost. Uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to uh, you know, have someone who's said to be a convert. It's another thing to have, you know, a Christian priest or bishop whose name is Ormaz something or, um, you know, Mir something. Uh, now, we have a bunch of these bishops with these names in the Synodicon Orientale. Uh, Christian seals have a number of names that mention the, the Zoroastrian gods, but also have symbols of crosses. Um, we have to be real careful here because obviously some of these names, uh, you know, names that mention the Yazata could just be, uh, you know, referring to the Christian God, but in, you know, in Persian. But, um, but I think that probably a lot of these converts, if they are converts, are coming from a sort of lesser nobility. They're Iranian, maybe they're raised as, as Magians, but they're not really important people. You know, one example of this is probably Mar'aba, which our martyrology makes it great big deal about his conversion to the faith that he's a Magian priest or at least raised as a Magian. Uh, he's a state of, or a secretary of, well actually he's on the staff of the secretary of the financial official. Uh, so he's somehow in there and they make a big deal about this, but it's not really such a big deal. Um, he's not any big person no matter what our Christian writers are, you know, inflate him into. But he does become a uh, the head of the Christian church. Uh, and rather interestingly, he is noted for his opposition uh, to Iranian social practices in the church. Um, most notably, he reintroduces uh, clerical celibacy, uh, which had been removed as a requirement for, for uh, priests uh, 50 years before. Uh, he also uh, wants to ban uh, marriages between close kin, uh, as being unchristian, but this is a major practice of the Iranian nobility. Um, and because uh, he does these things according to the, the martyr, or according to our uh, saint's life, he's sent off for seven years to Azerbaijan in exile um, due to the king's hostility and the hostility of the priests. He's eventually recalled when the king needs him again, uh, uh, like uh, Sabri show, to put down a rebellion or help put down a rebellion. Uh, is the story that we have here. So, I think most of our stories of conversion tend to be of rather low-level people, um, at least until the end of the Sasanian dynasty, because there are some real problems if you're an aristocrat uh, to becoming Christian. Uh, celibacy is a big problem. <laughs> um, that if you are an aristocrat and you want to be a bishop, you want to be able to pass along the office of bishop to your children. Uh, also, as I've mentioned, close kin marriage is a way to keep 
land uh, and wealth in the hands of the family. Uh, so it's a major practice among uh, Iranian elites at this time. Also, multiple marriage frowned upon uh, here. Uh, there are problems that Christians, uh, certainly Christianity developed as a faith where the idea is that you're supposed to give up all your wealth to the church. Uh, this is not a big popular thing among aristocrats, obviously. Um, and the aristocratic lifestyle does not lend itself to a sort of Christian ascetic lifestyle. Uh, hunting, drinking, feasting, all the things that Iranian aristocrats want to do are not things that priests are supposed to do in excess. Luckily, though, for nobles that were attracted to Christianity, there is a exception. <laughs> and that's in Armenia. Uh, that Armenia uh, converts to Christianity, uh, at least according to stories, uh, in the fourth century here, uh, under the Arshakuni kings, uh, this is their mausoleum. Um, and Armenia is a culturally Iranian place. Uh, that the great families of Armenia are essentially related to the Parthian family, great families of Iran. Uh, they have various privileges within the Sasanian world of, you know, being presented in place in, in the Sasanian court. Uh, and when they convert, at least the elites of Armenia convert, uh, and at least by the 5th century, you know, many Armenian and other Caucasian nobles are notionally Christian, at least. Um, they convert, but they don't stop being nobles. <laughs> um, now, certainly we have stories of this being a problem. Uh, the uh, famed uh, Battle of, uh, of Ariar, uh, in which the uh, Armenian nobility, Christian Armenian nobility, is supposedly decimated by the Sasanians uh, for uh, their Christianity here. But again, I think we have to be real careful uh, that these are sources that are written by Christians after the fact to valorize, you know, people who might not have had this notion of themselves first and foremost as Christians. Um, but certainly Armenia is a place that converts to Christianity, but Armenian Christianity is very distinctive. Um, that before Christianity comes along, temples and lands belong to aristocratic families. Uh, just as they do in Iran. Um, now, the most powerful of these pagan priestly families are wiped out. Their lands are confiscated, uh, and actually they're distributed to the families of the first bishops, uh, who basically take over this. Lesser priestly families seem basically to have just made the switch from, you know, we worship the gods to we worship God. And they just keep doing what they're doing, but in a sort of Christian guise. But what we see here is very close association of nobles hold offices uh, in the church. Uh, and once the Arshakuni royal dynasty dies out, basically the great noble families of Armenia come to control the most powerful seats of bishops in the Armenian church. That in uh, documents of various councils of the Armenian church, a bishop is not a bishop of a place in many cases, he is a bishop of a family the bishop of the Maimakoni. Uh, so, this gives a nice and ready-made model of how to do Christianity for aristocrats. That the aristocrats control the religious institutions. Uh, they control the land that belongs to the church in their, their territories. They control charitable institutions. Uh, they hold ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical offices as a sort of hereditary thing within the family. Uh, and Christianity serves these families to valorize various aristocratic virtues. Uh, you know, we are great warriors, we are warriors for the faith. Uh, and occasionally, uh, for example, uh, Christina Maranzi has, has argued that uh, the church of uh, the Amatuni family uh, is essentially set up as a kind of, you know, martyr shrine to the family here. Now, does this happen in Iran? Uh, the problem is, uh, I don't entirely know, but I do know that there are a lot of bishops that very suspiciously have the names of Iranian great families. 
There are a lot of bishops named Surin. Uh, there are bishops named Varaz. Uh, you know that that seem to, in some cases, to be in places that we know are controlled by these families. So it would make a certain amount of sense to say, well, the Surin family has taken over this uh, Episcopal see. Uh, certainly, uh, we do have evidence that eventually, after the Sasanian period, that a Catholicos named Soren is in fact a member of the Soren family. So, um, so why convert? Well, I guess it's a sort of alternative uh, source of power. Uh, Christian faith provides access to new sources of social and political power. Um, and also, as we see under Husserl II, Christian nobles often uh, find themselves in a, a good position vis-a-vis -vis the king of kings, uh, particularly uh, in Khusro's struggle against other great uh, Parthian families uh, who rebel against him. Uh, many of his, his most uh, valuable supporters are in fact Christians. Uh, the revolt of his uncle, uh, Mistam, is put down at least in part by Simbat Bagratuni, who he started this uh, presentation with. Uh, his chief finance minister uh, is Yazdi, uh, who, although there's a certain amount of de debate about this, seems to be an Iranian official, who uh, supposedly was beloved by Khusro, even as was Joseph in the sight of Pharaoh. Uh, he builds churches, he's called by his local community the head of the believers. Um, and uh, he's a patron of Christians throughout the empire and also in the lands that are conquered by the king of kings. Uh, so Husserl is benefiting from this, certainly, uh, by playing one aristocratic faction, this one Christian, against a non-Christian faction, perhaps. And along the way, uh, makes a fair claim to be the king of the world and the king of all Christians everywhere. Um, Unfortunately, this is also his undoing. <laughs> that by normalizing Christians and uh, having Christians in the elite, uh, I think one of the critical issues here is that Christians who enter, who are themselves aristocrats, never stop thinking of themselves as aristocrats. They're aristocrats first. And so it is that when Khusro II uh, meets his fate, uh, it's not just at the hands of the Iranian nobility, the Zoroastrian nobility, the Parthian great families, uh, there, side by side with them, are Christian aristocrats as well. Uh, the Shamta, uh, the son of Yazdin, uh, is there with a sword uh, to chop his head off. That whatever Khusro's support of Christians meant, uh, he's overthrown by a cabal of nobles that are not just uh, Iranian and Zoroastrian, but they're also Iranian and Christian. So, to finish, first of all, I think we should be very careful uh, to assume that there is some sort of consistent political or religious ideology that defines royal interaction with Christians. It's mutual exploitation, it's patronage, um, but there's no policy here. For non-noble Christians, royal tolerance meant you serve the king. Service to the king is good because it enhances your place within the church. It also enhances the position of the church. And it supports the king. But for Iranians, especially the high nobility, uh, we have to treat them separately. That Christian sources will tell us that these are great Christians. They're, you know, they endow monasteries, they do all sorts of great Christian things. But when it comes down to it, you know, when the rubber hits the road, these aristocratic Iranian Christians, fundamentally, or, or Armenian Christians, are fundamentally aristocrats first, and courtiers first, and Christians second. And, you know, to finish, I think, basically, we have to think that everything we, we read about this, we have to read very carefully, and we also have to read with the clear notion that not all Christians are equal, not all nobles are equal, and that we can't treat this as a sort of size, one size fits all problem. So thank you very much uh, for listening. And